enough money for a video, and here comes the video. So. Okay, good morning, everybody. And I know I am the last speaker between you and a bathroom break. So we're going we're gonna to push through this pretty quickly, but I do have some acknowledgments I want to make up front. Um, first, uh, in the last four years, there's been a steady increase in participation here at today's event, or the next few days' events. And when we were talking about why that is, there was a lot of things brought up around my table. First, it was identified the collaboration uh, between TRADOC, AMC, and ASALT, and the team approach to bringing this together. Uh, and it felt conducive to people having open dialogue. The second was because of the great AUSA team that comes and brings this venue together for us and allows us to meet with industry, meet with each other, and talk out hard things. Uh, and I agree with that as well, right? Remarkable. But I would tell you that the third and probably the most dominant uh, uh, impact on why so many people keep coming back here every year and increased registration of over 4,000 individuals this year is because of the local community, right? Because of the welcome we receive from uh, both Huntsville and Madison County, and it is just impressive to watch this small community raise up and support us, our Army, the way they do. So I'd like to acknowledge them and give them a round of applause. So this morning, I'd like to uh, say thanks to the Acting Undersecretary, Mr. Carl Schneider. Sir, what an honor. Thank you for being here today. I'd also like to acknowledge our CASA, right, civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army, Dr. Fitzgerald. Sir, thank you. Always supporting us. It's really remarkable. Of course, to General Ham, uh, sir, thanks for pulling us all together and leading your great team. Uh, the venues you provide us to talk about our message are remarkable, and, and it doesn't go, it's not lost on how much work it takes. To General Perkins, uh, Dave, thanks for being here. And then, of course, to Ms. Stephanie Easter, my battle buddy, uh, as we work through um, acquisition, uh, support, and sustainment of our Army. Stephanie, always great. Thank you so much. Uh, it would be remiss. He's not here, but I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, eat a little bit of cheese with him anyway. Um, my favorite Mark Twain quote goes like this. The two most important days in a person's life are the day you are born and the day you figure out why you were born. And I suggest General Sullivan's uh, second day was the day he figured out he was going to be an American soldier. Uh, serving us throughout his career, uh, both as a soldier and then as the president of AUSA, and now bringing our museum across the finish line is just a testament to his loyalty and selfless service. And though he's not here today, I just want to say thanks, General Sullivan. <laughs> to my fellow general officers, uh, both uh, active and retired, and to the senior executives, to our soldiers, our great DOD workforce, and of course our industry partners, welcome. Everybody's welcome. Uh, I will uh, be remiss if I didn't acknowledge something I was taught early on. Later on in my career as a colonel, but early on in my um, ability to inf affect things. And that is our industry partner and what they bring to us. Our industry partners are true partners. Right? Without them, we could not dele deliver, integrate, and synchronize logistics and sustainment on our battlefield. And thank you for what you do every day. Thank you for being a part of the solution. For without you, we couldn't do it. So thanks for making time to be here today. So if General Perkins' explanation of the future was crystal ball, or identified as the crystal ball, and Ms. Easter's presentation was more about money ball, uh, and I appreciate you doing that because I'm going to fill in those blanks, uh, you can think about my presentation as the wrecking ball. Right? And I don't mean that in a negative way, but the way we are approaching things in Army Materiel Command is about pressing back on status quo. As Ms. Easter talked about, there is better ways to do things. First, we have to challenge ourselves inside, then we have to challenge ourselves outside, but it must always be about output, not the processes that we've become so accustomed to over the last 15 plus years. 
We are doing this every day. General Milley, our Chief of Staff, recently in the AUSA magazine, and I quote, the structure and organization of our Army, both operational and institutional, may change drastically. Every assumption we hold, every claim, every assertion, every single one of them must be challenged. This is why we do sessions like this, so that we can see ourselves and challenge status quo. That's what the Chief has directed us to do, and that's what we need to hold ourselves accountable to do. We're doing that inside of Army Materiel Command, both inside and outside. Every day, it's about output. It's about readiness. It's about modernization. It's about what's best to provide our soldiers on the battlefield the confidence they need to move towards the enemy. Fourteen years ago today, I was sitting in Kuwait as a battalion commander, getting ready to cross the border. We were going against a powerful army, as many of us do remember. In those first few days as we crossed the border, it was near peer competitor. It was tank on tank. It was soldier on soldier. And there was fierce fighting at times as we moved up and towards victory. With that said, though, I will tell you that the, the common factor that was not there that is part of our Army today was there was no contractors. There was no extra capability. We trained to fight. We trained to support ourselves. And then we executed it in a decisive action capability. I tell you this because quickly after 2003, when I went back in 2005 and 2006 as a brigade commander, I found myself surrounded by contractors. And don't take me long. It was very much appreciated as we were allowed to focus on the war fighting that was required. However, we created a lot of bad habits as we worked our way through this partnership. And now 2010 and on to 2016, we find ourselves in a position where I personally believe we're not ready to execute a decisive action fight against a near-peer competitor. And it's not because we don't have the great leaders and soldiers that have been trained in the last 15 years who have de demonstrated courage and initiative and have led from the front. It's because the skills we need in particular for sustainment have atrophied. I would suggest the skills both in acquisition as they fielded our Army in such a rapid approach and our ability to sustain that equipment collectively have atrophied. That's what Ms. Easter was talking about and that's what I'm talking about. Our ability to produce output for our soldiers is our number one requirement. It's the Chief's number one priority and it's our number one executable task. As we know, the war is continuing on in the Middle East. It will continue on in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria until the President determines otherwise. But one would suspect, without having a crystal ball, that we'll be doing it for a while. But what is the next real big war? Where is the near-peer competitor fight going to be? We know that there's things going on in Europe. We know there's things going on in the Western Pacific. So the question is, is are we prepared to execute that? Are we ready to do near-peer competitor action? We know that on the battlefield there'll be IEDs. We know we'll be constrained as we move up the lines of communication. As we demonstrated in the last 15 years, we will overcome that. We'll overcome that through ingenuity, We'll overcome that with soldier courage and leadership. We will overcome that. But will we be able to overcome the capability that eliminates a whole brigade while it's en route from a CONUS installation to the next fight? Can we project ourselves, now that we are really a CONUS-based army, can we project ourselves, can we receive ourselves, and can we execute onward movement into the battlefield while there will be an enemy, as General Perkins uh, articulated, that will do everything in their power to stop us before we get there? On this battlefield, everything will be challenged for us. 
our ability to project ourselves simultaneously in a synchronized and integrated way from all of our installations through our ports over to a country that may or may not be ready to receive us without loss of equipment will be a challenge in itself. But added any loss, a ship sinking, a train blowing up, where a whole BCT's worth of equipment could be lost. Are we ready to react to that? Do we have the acquisition system? Do we have the planning and the know-how and the knowledge to execute in a simultaneous method to support our maneuver commanders? That is the real question of today. This is what General Perkins was talking about. Are we seeing ourselves and are we preparing ourselves to execute in a multi-domain battle? I say we're working towards that end. The Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary of the Army have us in that position. They are focusing us on readi readiness and modernization. They are focusing us to challenge status quo. But it's not good enough. We have to execute. We have to execute every single day today. We have to execute inside of ourselves. We have to execute as an army. And we have to execute together with our partners. Because frankly, the challenges of tomorrow will be nothing like we've had yesterday. And we must position ourselves not unlike the New England Patriots, who are so good at all their tasks, <coughs> and I gag at that, I'm sorry. Um, but truly, they're a remarkable organization, not because they're relying on an individual player, or in our case, a staff section, an organization, a unit, but as the collective team, the confidence they have that they all know what they're doing the confidence that the next player will step in, the confidence that there is no one organization or individual on that team that operates on their own. It has to be synchronized and integrated. So like the Patriots, what Army Materiel Command is doing right now is focusing on being the best that we can to execute our mission. Our focus is on is on first making sure 100% of our workforce is executing 100% of the work. We don't have time. We must have everybody engaged. Second, we must make sure our Army pre-positioned stocks are prepared and ready to go. We position them throughout the world. Why? To create angles, to create mismatches. They will not be worth our time if we don't have the right equipment on our APS sets, in our APS sets. Not only the right equipment, but equipment that'll work when we pull it off the ships. And then equipment that works, that has the right radios, the right uh, uh, command structure, the right weapons, so that we're ready to fight at a moment's notice. That is what we're working on right now. That is what the Chief of Staff has recently approved and directed funding for us to do. As Ms. Easter talked about, we do have quite a bit of equipment on hand. In fact, we have 980,000 pieces of equipment, 980,000 pieces of equipment that are in, uh, that are the right equipment, but they're in the wrong place. We have to execute 980,000 lateral transfers across the Army's three compos to ensure our force is ready. We've done a remarkable job bringing equipment to our force. Now we have to get it to the right place. And don't let it be lost on anybody. It's not making sure Compo 1 or the active duty force is capable, but all three Compos. It is one Army, and collectively, we are a great Army. And so the Chief of Staff of the Army's guidance to me is ensure readiness is filled, equipment on hand to all three Compos simultaneously. But as Mr. Easter talked about and identified, there is 1.3 million pieces of excess equipment located in our units. 1.3 million pieces of excess equipment that we do not need, and we must divest of it immediately. There is another 600,000 pieces of equipment located in our depots, equipment that I fund another organization to maintain, funding that I don't need to spend, funding that I could put in other places, 
So together, we're going to eliminate that 2.1 pieces of excess equipment in the next five years. It's going to take a team effort and approach to doing that. With contracting, as we talked about earlier, Ms. Easter brought up, we need to increase the speed and accuracy as we develop our requirements, as we identify the acquisition strategy. And then we need to hold ourselves accountable to the milestones and execution of the contracting process. It's not just to say we did it. It's not a metric of 200,000 contracts a year at $50 billion. It's about the output we're trying to achieve. This great organization, Army Contracting Command, the soldiers and civilians inside of it work every day to enable the services of our Army. We owe it to them to identify the right strategies and then allow them to execute contracting to standard. We have to hold ourselves accountable, and I pledge that to you. With that said, there's some things we need to work on, right? I'm a big believer in small business. I'm a big believer in big business. It's the combination of the two that will make us great. It's not a metric for one and a pay attention to the other. It's a combination of both. The output that I told my commanders to look for is readiness not the metric. It's not about executing so much small business and sustaining big business. It's about ensuring the places that we execute a contract, they are capable to provide the readiness we're looking for. This is essential. We must get the product that we're paying for. We, we cannot be the ones that hold everybody up. Just like you hold me accountable to execution, I am going to hold you accountable to execution. But together we can do this. We are working hard. We are working very hard, Ms. Easter and I, on how do we reduce um, the requirement for protest. We're taking that obligation on us. How do we ensure perfection in the execution of what we do? How do we define the requirement? define the criteria for selection, and then make the right selection to impact readiness. We're taking that on. We're going to hold our workforce accountable to that end state. I ask as you work through the process that you don't bombard us with unnecessary protests. I will tell you for sure, I am not getting any more people in Army Contracting Command. That's a fact. The key is to hold ourselves high to high uh, execute high standards, Make sure we define the requirement, the, the selection criteria, and then make the unbiased right selection that will impact readiness. I need you to help self-assess. It cannot be on autopilot. Protests are anchoring us down, just anchoring our capability to do other things. As we work through contracting, I think we're going to get better every day because our workforce is some of the most technical people I've ever been around, and I have confidence in them. The organic industrial base, our outputs must be better linked to the Army's operational requirements, not maintaining a workforce. We want the right workforce. We want the artisan capability that we have, but it cannot be driven based on workload. Our organic industrial base must be linked to the Sustainable Readiness Program. Our ability to ensure readiness for our brigades is our number one priority. Currently, right now, the process is about keeping workload in the organic industrial base. I am not a fan of this. I am a fan of maintaining the right workload to maintain the right people so that the capability is there when we need it most to surge in the time of war. My belief, based on the current way we workload our organization, our, or, our OIB, it, it will not exist in the near future. We must connect the work they do to the sustainable readiness model so that when Congress wants to take money away from that capability, we can properly articulate the impact. Right now, when they call me and they say, hey, we're going to take $150 million out of the depot workload program, what is the impact? I respond with, well, that's four tanks, two Bradleys, 
a striker, and three aircraft. That does not resonate. What I need to respond with is if we do not, if you take that money, I will not be able to reset 1st Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division. And the impact is equipment will break down on the battlefield. The impact is soldiers will lose confidence in our equipment we are giving them. The impact is that the supply chain on the battlefield extends. It can't be about workload. It's got to be about the right workload to sustain the artisan workforce we have and enable Army readiness. And so we're working hard to make the changes in that. As we work through that, our process in the OIB, one of the things we must assure is supply availability. As Ms. Easter talked about, we must have confidence that the things that we've all agreed to are coming our way. We must have 100% supply availability. We must ensure the repair parts that are needed both to train and are required on the battlefield to ensure our soldiers maintain confidence in their equipment are available. We have to restructure our demand process. The algorithms we've used in the past, in my belief, are not right. We have to change the algorithm to meet the future demand, not react to the past demand. And we're executing that right now. And we're holding ourselves accountable to figuring out who and why we don't have 100% supply availability. I will tell you, a lot of that is my responsibility. We took our eye off the ball, but we got it back on it. And we are holding ourselves accountable to the standards and the discipline necessary to achieve 100% supply availability. I will tell you, many people came to me and they said, sir, you can't afford it. You can't afford 100% supply availability. And I said, prove it. And they laid out a bunch of numbers to me. They really did. A lot of numbers. Clearly on paper demonstrated to me that we can't afford it. So then I pushed back in my chair, I took off my glasses, and I asked, let's take ourselves down to a platoon of tanks. Four tanks. Four tanks that were crossing the line of departure in 2003, heading up into Iraq. All of a sudden, as they crank up their engines, two tanks are not working. They quickly identify and diagnose the problem. And then we find out the repair part's not there for either tank. What happens? Those two tanks stay. The other two tanks in that platoon move forward. Is that the risk we're willing to take? Is that the priority of our funds, not to have 100% supply availability? That is not the risk I'm willing to take. And I've pledged the Chief of Staff of the Army that we will fix this, but I need everybody's help to get there. I want you to think about the two tanks that went across the border by themselves and now are unable to maneuver because they don't have their wingmen. That is our responsibility. Science and technology. I agree with Ms. Easter's comments. We need to fund, we need to prioritize, and we need to hold ourselves accountable to developing capability for our future Army. And we're in the process of doing that with the Chief of Staff of the Army's guidance. I think we can move ourselves forward, and I think we can continue to maintain the great labs, the great scientists, the great engineers, and take the capability to fight the next war. I think in surface trans transportation, we need to treat every exercise we do as an operational exercise. This year, the Army will execute 55 unit moves. 55 unit moves. We need to work with Transcom. We need to make sure we are capable to deploy to an Army, not just a training exercise. These moves will make us better. We need to focus ourselves on readiness impact, not on how much money we maintain in the working capital fund. And we need to train our soldiers to project ourselves and receive ourselves so that we provide our maneuver commanders with flexibility and options. And last but not least, in foreign military sales, 
We need to enable our partners with our equipment. We need to build capabilities so that they can be our allies on the battlefield. If you think about Afghanistan and Iraq, they are essentially U.S. capability with Afghanistan or Iraqi soldiers. We fielded that. We helped them develop their capacity. The industrial base. This capability is without bound, and it can bring a lot to us. And we don't know when it will impact us, and we should pre prepare for the future. But it cannot be about sales. It has to be about building partner capacity. So thank you. All right. I do believe, as General Perkins told you, that as he set the crystal ball, that our future is going to be multi-domain battle and that we have to prepare. I do believe, as Ms. Easter talked to you about, that it will take the right amount of monies and synergy uh, and holding ourselves accountable to the execution to make sure that capability is there for us. But I strongly believe that in order to prepare for the future, we have to hold ourselves accountable today. And that's what we're working on. So for that, I say thanks to everybody that's involved. Thank you for our partnership. Thank you for the work that gets done every day. And God bless all of you. And I'll take some questions now, sir. General Perna, please discuss the impact of equipment fieldings in excess. It seems like the Army has fielded equipment over the last 15 years in an ad hoc fashion. So um, I, I usually have this as a part of my uh, speech, but let me, I just want to reflect for some of you that don't know this. In 2003, uh, when I crossed the border, my own personal experience, my soldiers and myself crossed the border in soft-skinned Humvees, right? I mean, this was a um, decisive action execution, and we crossed the border with soft-skinned Humvees. In 2005-6, when I went back as a brigade commander, we were up-armoring every piece of equipment that was on the battlefield. In 2010, when I went back as a J-4, we were uh, fielding MRAPs. No other country in the world could do that. That, that was, that was uh, ASALT. That was our PMs and PEOs and our great support from Congress to fund that capability that allowed us to do that. No other country in the world could do that. And that's just vehicles that I was articulating. We did it with communications, we did it with weapons, we did it with munitions, right? No other country in the world. But as we did that, and we did it in such a rapid manner to field and protect our soldiers, that we stopped holding ourselves accountable to managing uh, the property. Uh, and, and, and getting rid of the excess. So what Ms. Easter and I are partnering up to do, our collective organizations, is, is now when we bring in uh, a piece of new set of equipment, we must eliminate the old set of equipment, right? We used to call that total force fielding. We were really good at it. Well, now we're bringing it back. Uh, and this will be essential to eliminating the burden from the soldiers, allowing us to get the right equipment forward, ensure that our soldiers are trained, uh, and we're focusing the right uh, amount of money on its readiness, not the readiness of old equipment. So it's a collaboration between ASALT, AMC, the G4, of course, Forcecom, uh, and our other ASCCs that will allow us to do that. But I have a lot of confidence we can get this done in the next five years. Uh, sir, when you talk about operationalizing Army Materiel Command, what role do you see for industry in enabling that effort? So, uh, so let me just say for a moment what the word operationalize is to me, all right? It, it's not a checklist. It, it's not something I can p put in a performance objective of a Department of Defense civilian or some uh, officer can write in their support form, it's an attitude, right? It's about getting ahead of the decision cycle. It's about enabling those that we support. Army Materiel Command is ING to the rest of the Army and the discussion. 
It's about influencing um, output through our actions, not our briefings, right? It's about taking this thought process and pushing it through the core of the organization that empowers everybody to say yes, to figure out how to make it happen. That is, that's what I believe operationalizing is all about. And so when I, when I think about how do we translate that into industry, my thought goes about how to solve our problems. I, I fundamentally believe that we constrain industry with our current process. I fundamentally believe when we design requirements with such specificity, it constrains and at times restrains innovation. I believe that in order to operationalize this partnership, we ought to identify the problem, and then we ought to allow you to come to us with solutions. And then it's the combination of solutions across the industry which might drive partnerships in, in itself, but help us to uh, achieve greater solutions. And as Ms. Easter talked about, enable us to bring the right equipment on at a rapid capability, rapid, uh, rapid time. This is how I would encourage industry to operationalize. But we have to change our modus operandi to, in order to enable that. I think we're getting there. I think, as Ms. Easter articulated, we started to see uh, that change being required, and we're executing that under the Secretary and the Chief. But we got a long way to go to change our own culture. Um, and it's going to take some great leaders, some partnership, uh, and some people to embrace the process. Uh, but, but I feel confident we'll get there. So, thank you, sir, very thank much, you so sir. much. How about a hand for General Perna? All right.